Hey everybody, today I want to tell you about my very first experience with ayahuasca when my brother and I had arrived at the retreat in October of 2014. So the very first night we were there, we had a group of five people. There were three Canadians and us and they were really awesome guys. So it was wonderful to be able to have a small group and be able to be with really awesome people because when you're drinking psychedelic medicine, like you are so open and so aware of things and the people that you're surrounded by can have a big effect on the experience that you're having. So the very first night we drank in the Maloka and then after that we drank in our rooms. Like so my brother and I were sharing a room, so we drank essentially alone in the room and everybody else was in their own rooms. So the first night, you know, we all were sitting in a circle around the Maloka with our guide in there. And I think most of us ended up laying down after not too long into it. And uh, what I discovered is that I definitely like to lay down and be in the darkness and, you know, being able to go deep within um, myself when I take these psychedelic journeys. Like, I don't like to be around a lot of people. I definitely don't want to be doing any kind of socializing. And even like the act of like sitting up, which so many people uh, in, you know, in the ayahuasca community have like a very strong belief system about, you know, they say, well, you have to sit up, like it's disrespectful not to sit up and the whole body mechanics aren't gonna work and everything. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit. You know, pretty much there's always gonna be really staunch belief systems in, in every school of thought and every spiritual practice. And, you know, you really gotta look at what, what works for you. Because maybe for some people it works to sit up. But like I couldn't even surrender into the experience sitting up because it just took so much work to hold my body upward and just laying back and just releasing all of that tension and all of the effort to hold my body in space and time was so much easier for me to take the inner journey just to be able to let go. You know, I didn't want to sleep. I don't know how anybody could sleep on that medicine. Like our guide was, you know, saying something about falling asleep. Like I think it's like an impossibility. Like you can't even sleep that night usually. Um, every night that we drank the medicine, I think probably the earliest I ever fell asleep was four or five in the morning. It's extremely difficult to fall asleep because there's so much going through your mind and your mind is just hyper aware of everything and you're like working things out and you're having these revelations and just maybe biochemically too something is going on it's almost like an adrenaline kind of thing happening in your body maybe it's the serotonin I'm not sure what but it definitely makes it more complicated to sleep so that wasn't a worry but no we, we drank the medicine which tastes horrible by the way like absolutely awful it wasn't nearly as bad the first time every single time after that that i drank it it was like worse and worse to the point where like i was even expecting the taste like before i would drink and like almost wanted to throw up just thinking about drinking it and you know really really having to be like grounded and present to like just get it down and then go get to my spot you know, and, and lay down and just start calming my body down and just stop trying to think about the taste and the smell and everything because as your senses are heightened from it, it's just even more intense, you know? And then when you're puking it up, you know, ayahuasca is known as la purga, which is the purge. It's also known as the vine of souls, um, but you definitely go through like this major purging. Almost everybody throws up from it at some point during the journey. And that's not a bad thing. It's part of the energetic cleansing that takes place. Like sometimes there's physical, actual stuff in your bucket, like everybody has a bucket next to them and you could just roll over and throw up. Um, but sometimes there's actually stuff in there and sometimes it's not. It's like you're just dry heaving and dry heaving because like energetically you're getting something out. Like it's not a physical thing and you've been fasting, you know, most of the day to get ready for this anyways. And, and I just, I have remembered, you know, moments of just like just dry heaving over the bucket trying to get stuff out. And then also a lot of people get really bad diarrhea. It'll only be during, you know, the several hours that you're working with the medicine. It doesn't like last beyond that or anything. And it's part of the purge. It just cleans everything out. And it's part of the healing effects. Like the ayahuasca actually does heal your body in so many ways. And it really just cleanses everything out of your intestines. And... You know, the amazing thing in Chinese medicine, they talk about the large intestine being related to grief. 
you know, and how much grief is released, you know, from, from the intestines in that way, just stuff that we've held on to for so long and hadn't been able to let go. So the very first night we drank the medicine and we had a silent ceremony. So, you know, we weren't working with a shaman. Our guide had more of a Gnostic approach, meaning you are your own shaman. You know, he was there if anybody got into trouble or had a difficulty and he had a lot of experience with the medicine, um, even though he turned out to be, you know, a narcissistic borderline type. But he did understand the medicine quite a bit. He had many years of experience with it. I felt safe in that way. I didn't really feel safe with who he was as a person, but I felt safe in his knowledge with the medicine. And, you know, in the Gnostic approach as well, it was really calling me. I didn't, you know, I had already learned that shamans are people, gurus are people, teachers are people, they're humans like everybody else. And I knew that I didn't want to place my power you know, in some sort of external person or thing that I wanted to find it within myself. So I was really drawn to this Gnostic approach. And I was also drawn to the idea of having a silent ceremony versus having a ceremony where there was like the singing of the Icaros. The Icaros are like the songs that the shamans sing. And I've heard a lot of these in documentaries and on YouTube and whatnot, and I find like it just like it grates at my spine. Like I don't like to hear that. So I imagine being in the medicine would be even more annoying to have to hear this kind of singing. I mean, for some people it works. You know, it, it helps them focus on things. But I also had experience with psychedelics before. Not a lot, but some. And our, you know, being a Pisces, I'm very much just connected with all of that. Anyways, it's it's like second nature for me in those realms. I feel much more at home in those realms than I do like in this reality, to be really honest. And I think that's just a Pisces thing. But, you know, we so we drink the medicine. It takes about 45 minutes or so for it to really start to kick in, and then the effects start coming on. And you know, so at the beginning, it was kind of you know, sacred geometry and uh, lights and colors and, and flowing things. And then it got real. And then I realized the first night that ayahuasca was showing me more of like almost an external or societal view of narcissistic abuse. It was a little bit related to me and it was related to me in general, but it was it was more of like like in, in a societal picture. The second night, it became very much about me. But so this first night, the first thing that I saw in my mind, I was seeing visions of like dismembered bodies. And at the time I remembered like not even feeling affected by it, but remembering that it was like a deja vu that for as long as I'd remembered, but I had totally forgotten it consciously. Anytime my mind went on idle, like I would see, dismembered bodies in my mind like I would close my eyes and I would just see dismembered bodies and like gore and it's so crazy because I, I have no memory of ever seeing anything like that I don't think I have at least not in this lifetime but it was it was just so prevalent it was always there and and it would just be like Ugh, and I would look away but then I would even forget it it would be like the abuse amnesia something similar where my mind would forget it so in, in this ayahuasca journey, you know, I'm seeing the dismembered bodies, but I'm realizing like it didn't affect me like it did before. Like it used to be like this horrible thing that I would see. And then it was sort of like that was fading away. And I saw this honeycomb and I realized that this like honeycomb shape, like, you know, you imagine the honeycomb shape, right? With all these little like compartments. And I realized that the honeycomb shape was like this form of mind control that was in my mind and it was the programming from the abuse and that somehow that I can't explain the narcissistic psychological abuse causes this fragmentation of the mind or the soul or the psyche and there's like these different little compartments in there and, and something about that having to do with the narcissistic abuse it was like an imprint and I didn't totally understand this at the time, but I watched the honeycomb like fragment and just dissolve into nothing. And I recognized that that was gone. Like whatever was holding that in place in my mind was gone. Then the next thing I remember was being taken on this cosmic tour, not of the cosmos exactly, but of this pattern. And I came to recognize that this narcissistic abuse pattern is like some kind of virus of the mind. 
and it's like it gets installed in the mind of people who are open to it and like want to utilize this power over other people and it also can get printed imprinted on the minds of people who are just not present and conscious and aware enough that when it comes in it's it's sort of like it just automatically gets installed and then they get hooked into this programming like it's like contagious that way and if you've hung around a narcissist you know it's contagious like that's what they call narc fleas right where like you start to pick up some of their behaviors or their tendencies or you start to create your own habits that you know are like a response to the abuse and none of those are things that you want in your life at all and it doesn't feel like you and it doesn't feel good but that is it's like the imprint and the effect of that kind of like mental virus that you can catch and so what i came to understand was that it was almost like there are agents meaning those who have chosen this path and they use this narcissistic abuse as a form of power and control and domination over other people and they do it quite consciously and willingly and then there are those who are more like drones like they're unaware of what they're doing and they're just going on automaton behavior because they're just checked out they're not conscious and present aware mindful of themselves and what's going on and the virus got in and the behavior is happening you know unconsciously then i got taken to like the 1600s or something it looked like some kind of european scene it was like the woods on the way to some city or town and i was kind of like observing this interaction and it was like the horse stagecoach and all that and then the drivers or whatever you call them the people who are controlling the horses that are driving this cart and there was someone really quote unquote important in the cart it was a woman she was some kind of like countess or something you know some someone who had fame and fortune and the people the two men it was like i was observing their reality and it was like it was like they were they were it was like it was the most important day of their life for them because they had the opportunity to do something so important like delivering this important person to the city suddenly gave their lives significance and i remember just feeling so like i don't even think sad is the word not even like disgusted i can't even really put into words like the ominous feeling I felt about that, like just just how sad that was that they thought this was the most meaningful moment of their lives because this person that they were driving around had fame and fortune and status and somehow that meant that if they were associated with that, then they were more important, you know, versus being some kind of meaningless person. And then i was in like vegas las vegas and i was like observing from table to table and location and what i saw was like i saw this virus in people's eyes and then i watched it pass from people to people like a smoke cloud so their eyes would be like spinning like this white and and red spinning spiral thing and it i don't know it reminded me of like roger rabbit I saw this movie when I was a, a child and it was kind of traumatizing in some ways that really evil character I haven't seen it in so long but something about the eyes reminded me of that movie just like almost it was like evil that you can see in the eyes and then it would be like this green smoke energy thing would go from person to person and there were like dollar signs you know connected with it and what I came to understand was that this kind of abuse had something to do with like fame and fortune and status you know not that fame and fortune and status makes you a narcissist but that narcissism was almost like like a celebration of that like as if fame fortune and status was all that mattered and that's what made you someone who mattered and what i realized was like this is like a societal problem like it is everywhere like it's not just in vegas and it wasn't just in that cart situation you know on the way to the city with the countess it was like 
it's, it's happening everywhere and you know we've we've kind of come to like just accept that these things are normal in society you know when we celebrate fame fortune and status and like we make important all this shit that doesn't even matter you know and we accept as normal some stuff that is really fucked up you know and and, and nobody really questions it like we just go on like an automaton behavior and just that's the way things are and that's how it perpetuates you know it doesn't have to be a conscious choice to hurt someone you know and, and actually be like one of those sorts of characters but it could just be the simple act of not caring not being present not being mindful just allowing it to be not questioning right because when you don't question you just accept things blindly you just accept things for what they are and then you don't do anything about it you don't change things when you don't question things so this went on for some time like seeing different scenes in that and I just remembered feeling like nauseated, nauseated by this pattern, by what I was seeing, by what it felt like. And I remembered seeing my own struggle, like with money, for example, because up until, you know, up until less than three months ago, I was still in this struggle. And it was like, it just couldn't manifest money. Like no matter what I did, it was not coming. Or there would always be some like catastrophe that would happen. Like every time I saved money, some catastrophe would happen. I would lose it all. Or I would meet another narcissist and somehow I would lose all the money that way. Or he would suck the money out of me in some way. Or somehow it happened. Or I just couldn't earn it. It was always this issue. And I recognized that I was coming at it from a bad place. That I was coming at it from this place of scarcity and lack and like as if money meant my worth as if money meant you know as if like success in terms of money meant the value of who i am as a human being and that i had to make money to prove that value and that's when i realized that like the self-worth and the self-value has to come first because if you don't have that you don't manifest value in the material world in the form of money. It's very difficult to manifest that if you don't have self-worth. And, and, and I realized that if I would improve my self-worth, then it would have like a direct reaction with money in the universe. Not in a way of like I had to seek it for fame and fortune or anything like that, but simply that it was like a natural consequence of elevating my self-worth that automatically, you know, the financial difficulties would resolve themselves and, and that, you know, my worth would be elevated in, in financial status, but recognizing that 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 didn't determine my worth, that money didn't determine my worth as a human being, and that my success wasn't just about money, you know, because I kept feeling like a failure. I kept feeling unsuccessful because the money wasn't coming. And I kept allowing people to make me feel that way. You know, they would say things like, I'm sorry, you're not more successful, <laughs> you know? And man, that would just like, it would upset me so much. And then I realized like the idea of success is like not attached to money. Like, we've come to believe that in our world, you know, but as Tony Robbins says, like success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure in life. So after these scenarios were going on and I had that realization and why it was so hard to manifest money and I was clearing these belief systems I was kind of opening my eyes a little bit to look around the room and you know I could see like the mounds of people under blankets you know on on their little um, like mattresses where we were laying and at some point it was very hard to open my eyes even and everything at that point it was just easier to go inside at some point I heard the sound of someone putting their shoes on because you take your shoes off when you walk in the Maloka I heard the sound of someone putting their shoes on I was assuming they were going to the baño and it was like the sound of the person putting on those shoes just felt so laborious that like I couldn't even pay attention anymore. It was like exhausting me to hear those sounds and I had to come back to myself. And I don't know how much time had passed by and I looked up again, but I sat up and I realized that my mind was playing tricks on me. Everyone had left. I was left alone in the room. And my mind was seeing the mounds of people under the blankets, but it was just a pile of blankets that they had left behind. The shoes were people leaving. So 
suddenly I have this like panic that I'm all alone in the world and like how symbolic was that of like the loneliness and that wound you know from the narcissistic abuse and I look down and I see this cup of chamomile tea with honey you know our guide had said he was going to make this tea it would help us to purge anything left and then also to you know come back to the body after the experience and I wanted that tea so bad but I wanted to go back to the the house to my room and I realized like I could either take the tea with me or I could take my body but I couldn't take both it was going to be enough of a challenge to get my body back to the building so what happens when you drink ayahuasca is you get like severe ataxia um, ataxia is like your body is drunk and so like you know when you're drunk with alcohol your body is drunk but your mind is stupid so your mind isn't really thinking about it like if you're falling all over stuff your mind isn't all that concerned about things and it's not that abnormal and maybe you're not even that aware like you know when you watch drunk people like you're a lot more aware of what they're doing than they are when it's happening but with ayahuasca your body is drunk but your mind is hyper clear and alert and so it's almost like your mind can't figure out why you can't get one foot in front of the other why it's so complicated to move your body so you know we're up in this maloca and you got to negotiate these stairs and it's like a little bit tricky and it's not like perfect stairs and then there's like this place where you have to walk past and there's like this little cliff and i remember trying to like magnetize my body to the side of this wall but my body was like almost just trying to fall off this cliff and it was so hard to do that and i tried to use my flashlight but just like the little tiny bit of light coming off of the flashlight was so disorienting that i couldn't even use it so oh and i forgot so when i opened the door to the malaka to go outside i immediately look out and i'm seeing the stars because it's almost pitch black out there and i immediately see the southern cross because i was in peru I was in the southern hemisphere and i looked straight at the southern cross and i had this like deja vu of an experience that i'd had with wachuma san pedro which is the cousin cactus of peyote which also grows in Peru, an experience that I'd had eight years prior when I was living with my teacher there. It was a very magical experience and it felt like a really good omen to see, you know, this, this Southern Cross before going down into the room. So I finally get back into the room and my brother's in there and I'm like, hey, you guys left me. And he's like, oh, I've only been back for like 10 minutes. I'm like, really? Time is so weird. So by that point, we were ready to talk and engage. We we're still kind of in the medicine, but not deeply in it. So we both laid down and we talked and we really started to process some of the childhood stuff. And he was deep into the, the childhood trauma. And he was telling me about stories that had happened with my mom that like I didn't even know. And then he told me that on his 18th birthday, he's three years younger than me. I was at college or living out of state by this time. And he told me that on his 18th birthday, you know, it was so bad that he was counting down his 18th birthday and he was just going to go enlist in the army and get the hell out. And I had no idea any of this was going on. And someone talked him out of that at the last minute. And when he was telling me the story, I was just like sobbing because like just the, the thought of like, what if I had lost him? Like, what if he had just disappeared? And I never heard from him again. Or what if something had happened to him? Or what if he had just like disowned the family at that point because of all the abuse that like what if we had lost contact you know and I was just like I had no idea I had, I had no idea even most of what he had gone through during high school after I had left the house you know because it was like overnight when I went to college it went from like half of the abuse probably a little bit more because he was the scapegoat but you know significantly more you know a hundred percent of the abuse was on him after I was gone and so it was really, really challenging for him to make it through that time. And, you know, he asked me if I remembered the day that Joy died in our house. And I'm thinking, who's Joy? And he goes, no, Joy. And then immediately I saw this memory. I had this flashback of that moment. And I, we were in the basement and I started to describe it. And he was like, that's exactly it. And it was like this stupid thing where we had asked permission if we could go to the pool. It was like the summer. and. You know, my dad was like, yeah, sure, I'll take you. 
And then we went, and he's like, go check with your mom. We went to ask my mom and she said no. And then she undermined my dad's decision and trying to tell him that he couldn't take us to the pool because we had to do this and that and the other and he had to get all this stuff done. He's like, that's okay, I can get all that done and take the kids to the pool. And she wouldn't have it, she wouldn't allow it. And she pushed it so hard that she emasculated him. And that was the day my dad broke. That was the day my dad stopped standing up to her. That was the day from then on, it was ask your mom, everything. You know, and then he was always sympathizing with her answer, whatever it was. Like he never took a stand after that. And to my brother, that was the day that joy died in our house. Like there was no more joy after that moment. She she killed it all. And every day, you know, it would be that way. And, you know, I was saying to him, like, we really should talk to her about this when we go back. In fact, we should have like a family meeting, all of us. And he was like, no, no, no. You know, he had tried to talk to her about it like 10 years before and, you know, she just said, started crying and told him, you're so cruel, you're so cruel for saying these things. So, you know, he just felt really invalidated and terrified to talk to her that she would just completely gaslight him again and minimize it and blame shift, you know, and guilt trip and all of that. And, you know, I kept thinking, well, you know, but it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there, you know, and, and we'll have this conversation. And, and, and in a way, I'm really glad that we didn't at the time because I didn't fully understand the magnitude of my mom's disorder at the time. And I might have let her get away with more than I should have, you know, more than I would right now. So, you know, he, he decided he didn't want to have the talk. And I, I told him, I was like, I have this memory album, like, this this was like the happiest day of my life. I was standing at the window of my bedroom and my grandma was next to me and she was calling me over to the window because you were coming home with mom and dad from the hospital after being born. So I must have been three, you know, when this happened. And, and I have this memory and I've had it off and on throughout my life, but like it came in so clear and I told him I was just like sobbing tears of gratitude and I was like, that was the happiest day of my life, like that you came came into my life and I wasn't like totally alone and like I just can't even tell you like the amount of joy that my brother had brought into my life like it's just these are tears of joy and gratitude it's not sadness it's just like this incredible gratitude that I have that he's in my life and I wouldn't have survived without him and you know I'm so sorry that what he went through you know was probably significantly worse than what I went through but we had each other and even though it was really hard for us to be close like growing up because there was so much divide and conquer you know and it really it wasn't until like almost when he was graduating from college from undergrad that like we really connected and that was the beginning of like our best friendship relationship and and it's been like that ever since then you know since our early 20s and I'm just so, so grateful that he's in my life. And that night and every night that we drank the medicine together at some point, I got to that point of just like sobbing tears of gratitude because that we were having this experience together, you know, like how many people have this experience to begin with? How many people get to share this experience with their sibling, you know, and process this and have this connection and, just just the connection that we have and the love that we have and just the incredible amount of gratitude that I have for his existence, for his presence in my life, you know? And it was an amazing experience. You know, I think we talked to like five o'clock in the morning and we processed a lot of stuff and like we laughed and we cried and like shitting our brains out, you know? And so like, I think it was just all the grief. Like I, I didn't purge at all until we started having that night, until we started having this conversation. And then it was like every 15 minutes or 30 minutes I was in the bathroom and it was just all the grief coming out of your body you know, and, and just then finally fell asleep maybe around five o'clock in the morning, but like I couldn't stop writing the experience in my head. So like I couldn't turn it off because it was just so vivid and I wanted to try to remember everything and I didn't want to forget it. But, um, so that's pretty much the wrap of the first night. Um, I wanted to make that really short and I'm realizing it's like half an hour already. Like I just, anyhow. So that was the first night experience. The second experience was the most powerful one. That was the one that was incredibly traumatizing for me. 
but just as cathartic, you know, in terms of healing. So that's the one I'm going to bring you next time is the second experience and how that, you know, played out like me seeing my internal reality. This first one was more of like the external societal reality. And then later, you know, talking with my brother, it became the familial dynamics, you know, and, and what happened in our family. But anyhow, those that's pretty much that's what I got out of out of the first night. And I'll be back very soon with the second night's experience to share with you. Sending you all a big hug.